Today on the 1012 podcast, myself and Eric Lopez look back at week six for Big 12 softball, including Kansas's incredible sweep over Baylor, OU's dominance over Texas Tech, and a peek at bracketology, who's in and who's out to the postseason for the Big 12, plus Kansas softball pitcher Casey Hamilton. With threats to our nation waiting around every corner, adaptability is more important than ever. When conditions change without notice, quick strategic thinking is crucial. And with obstacles consistently impending, determination is essential in overcoming them. It's this willingness, decisiveness, and resilience that sets Marines apart. With our fighting spirit, we don't just fight battles, we win them. Marines are the constant our nation counts on to fight the unknown. And through adaptable problem solving, we do just that. Learn more at Marines.com. It's only a kick. A jump. A block. It's only a serve. It's only a tackle. A run. It's only for the fans. After all, it's only pressure. You got this. Adidas. Welcome to the 10-12, the podcast that covers all 14 teams in the Big 12 Conference, plus Colorado, Arizona, Arizona State, and Utah, where the flagship show the 1012 Network. Find every show on the network at 1012network.com. And of course, we are partners with Sports Social, Europe's biggest sports podcast network. Thank you for joining us for our midweek episode. I am your host, Philip Slavin. Uh, it is Thursday. That means that we're talking softball. Now, there's a few things we have to get to before then, because obviously March Madness really kicks off today. I, I understand the first four and as we know, say it all with me, every year since the first four started, one of the teams has made it to at least the round of 32, say for 2019, which 2019, if you start looking, is like the outlier year of the last decade of all the weird things that happened, except for in 2019. Anyways, uh, we posted some tips and stuff on Twitter, a bunch of like trends that have kind of paid attention to if you're filling out your bracket. Of course, we have our bracket challenge on ESPN with Charlie Hustle. Uh, uh, depending upon when you hear this, that may be closed because once the games tip off, you no longer can do any sort of updating of your bracket. But you can enter our group if you hear this before games tip off. Uh, we are giving prizes uh, in our partnership with Charlie Hustle. The winner of our men's and women's bracket gets a $100 gift card to Charlie Hustle. Second place gets $50 gift card. Third place gets $25 gift card. So first, second, or third, you're going to win. We've got more than 100 entries on the men's side. We've got more than 40 on the women's. So if you've got a bracket already filled out, you might as well come and join the group. No reason not to. Uh, one other note, of course, speaking of Charlie Hustle, if you're going to be in Kansas City this weekend for the wrestling NCAA wrestling championship which is going on this weekend in Kansas City obviously plenty of opportunities for big 12 wrestlers to win an individual national championship I think we all know Penn State's probably going to win the overall national championship again but plenty of big 12 uh, wrestlers in contention there if you're going to be in Kansas City make sure and stop by Charlie Hustle there you have a promotion going on Thursday Friday and Saturday both online and in store. I'm going to get, pull the email up so I can run down the details of that. Thursday through Saturday, in store and online, $30 off college varsity jackets, 20% off college fleece, and $10 off. I Okay, make sure I did that right. $30 off the college varsity jackets, 20% off college fleece, 10% off college t shirts. So that again, $30 off varsity jackets, 20% off college fleece, $10 off college t shirts online and in in store Thursday through Saturday. Uh, so don't worry about our promo code. You're not going to need it for those things. You want to take advantage of those deals instead. And of course, our promo code 101215 TEN, the number 12. Uh, yeah, TEN 1215. Sorry. <laughs> Gets you 15% off on non sale items regularly. But go take advantage of that promotion going on this weekend, both online and in store. Like I said, if you're in Kansas City for Wrestling Championship, make sure also you check out the Pin 12 podcast. Pin 12, of course, very clever name. It is our wrestling podcast here on the 1012 Network. They cover Big 12 Wrestling. Uh, Lee and Sam do an absolutely incredible job. I know Lee will be in Kansas City uh, for the wrestling championship, so follow Pin 12 Podcast on Twitter. They're going to have you covered there uh, throughout the weekend. Okay, it is Thursday. Like I said, we're going to talk softball. Joining me this week, no Leah. She couldn't make it this week, and I did not find a fill-in for her because we had a Monday episode to recap the bracket, and then we had a coaching search for West Virginia and OSU basketball that went up. 
on Tuesday. And then I got an interview for this episode with Casey Hamilton, pitcher for Kansas, which is coming up shortly. So no Leah, but I do have the voice of UCF softball uh, and apparently baseball now. And one of the many voices you hear on Sons of UCF, he is Eric Lopez. What an introduction. Yeah, you got a lot going on, man. That was incredible. I, I'm excited to be back on. Leah is obviously watching Iowa State men's basketball in the uh, as a two seed, getting ready in the tournament. Yeah, South Dakota State, and then either I meet up with uh, Drake or uh, Washington State, assuming that they don't. Uh, that the curse of the two seed losing to the 15, which has happened three years in a row, doesn't befall them this weekend. Uh, fingers. I've seen a lot of Iowa State fans on Twitter going like, I've got this thing that I already planned and I'm going to. Uh, please don't ruin my evening when I get home. So hopefully Iowa State uh, does their Cyclones a solid and doesn't uh, end up like the, I think the last time they were a two seed, which was years ago when they got upset in the first round. One of the first two seeds to ever do so. Say la vie, we don't want to bring up past things. Iowa State fans uh, struggling with it if they're listening to the uh, Big 12 softball podcast right now. We're not going to talk about their midweek game. We do want to talk about this past weekend, and we can we can give Iowa State some props because, Eric, I'm curious which teams impressed you. I've got to say, Iowa State, Leah has said it over and over again, once it gets to conference play, Iowa State performs far better than they do in non-con. They hosted Houston for the weekend, got two wins this weekend from Houston boosted their RPI all the way up into the eighties. So good thing for the big 12 is there's no sub 100 RPI teams anymore. There's no quad four games on the rot on the, the schedule anymore. Assuming Iowa state doesn't continue to drop, but I mean, I, it, it's gotta be a positive takeaway for, for an Iowa state team in a season where it is tough. And at this point, if I had told you heading into conference play that Iowa state would have a better big 12 record at two and four than both Baylor and BYU, if I had said that to you, the, the look you just gave me, because podcasting is obviously a visual medium, uh, is exactly yeah. the look I would expect. That is wild. Yeah, when you think about it, that's wild that they're ahead of Baylor. But look, credit to Iowa State bouncing back, winning that home series against Houston. That was big. The team that impressed me, and I think it's impressed everybody, is Kansas. Sweeping Baylor. Credit to you. You were on the Kansas bandwagon at the beginning of the year. You liked him as a sleeper. And I was kind of not sold until I saw him live against UCF. Casey Hamilton pitched a shutout against UCF. Then they come back, sweep Wichita for a midweek doubleheader. But then the sweep Baylor. Wow. With Katie Brooks and company. That is huge for the Jayhawks. You look at their resume now. Two wins over Wichita State. Three wins against Baylor. I know Baylor's got some roster issues I'm sure we'll get into. But to get those wins, the win against UCF, you have a win against AM. Kansas, Jennifer McFalls, this was all or in for Kansas this year. And right now they put themselves in great shape to make the NCAA tournament for the first time since 2015. Yep. I mean, you got four quad one wins. You've got, I mean, they're 26 in the RPI at time of recording this. That is, I mean, they are almost on the verge of being a quad one win as well. Like if someone were to beat them, that's, that's good for the big 12. You've got your first bracketology at D1 softball coming out today. The day this episode drops, people are listening on Thursday. I, can can you give me a little sneak? I don't know when it's going to drop, so I want a little sneak peek. I assume you have Kansas in the field as of today. Oh, yeah. I got them in the field. And right now, as of this recording, we got I got seven from the Big 12. Think about that, fellas. When's the last time we said seven teams from the Big 12 in softball would get into the tournament? It's been a while. Usually the last few years they've been stuck on that four, maybe five, like in 2021 when Iowa State got in. But I think they got a great shot to get seven, six for the minimum. And it's because this league is deeper. And that's what the coaches told me before the year. And I think Kansas is a great example of that. A couple of, you know, in the, in the past, Kansas would drop some of these games and you're like, oh, they blew their chance. This year, they're winning those games with their experience and they're helping raise the league. I think Kansas right now, Kansas right now, you could argue, might be behind Oklahoma, Texas, and Oklahoma State. They might be the fourth best team in the Big 12. They swept Baylor just now. Uh, and Baylor, as we'll get to, has some Baylor roster questions. Kansas might be the fourth best team in the Big 12 right now. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to predict that you have Texas, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State in, as well as Baylor, Kansas, yes. and Texas Tech um, with Nate, with UCF sitting at 48 in the RPI. Like the 14 and 11 record is not great, but they're not out of this in any way, no. shape, or form. They've got so, plenty of opportunities for wins to work their way back in. So I have UCF as the seventh Big 12 team in. They're actually okay. my last team in. Why? Who beat Kansas twice? UCF did. Uh, Liberty, who beat Charlotte midweek. They're about to get into that top 50. That's a quality win that UCF's going to get back. I'll give you this stat. 
People, well, what's wrong with UCF? They're 14-11. There, there's some, you know, situational hitting things that have then broke right for them. You realize UCF has the 14th strongest schedule in the country? 14th! And that's without still having to play Texas, who they have this weekend. They still got to go to Baylor. They still got to go to Texas Tech. They host Oklahoma. My point is, this schedule is not going to get easier. But the 14th strongest schedule. They have challenged themselves, so that's why the win-loss record is not as gaudy. But the committee historically, Philip, loves teams that challenge themselves. And if UCF can prove that they can win their share of games, I think they would get into the field. That's why their RPI is actually pretty good at 48, even though they feel like a disappointment at this point. Uh, I, I don't mean to just sit here and plug D1 softball. We're subscribers to it. You obviously contribute to it, both with the In the Circle podcast being a part of it now and doing uh, the bracketology there. But I, they have this Diamond Sports ranking that is now part of the website, which I I love because we obviously do our resumes. It's got the quad one, two, three, four breakdowns with the, with the teams and, and where they slot in there. But having things like the strength of schedule and strength of schedule rank, um, having their diamond sports ranking in here, best wins, worst losses, uh, win loss record. I, I, I appreciate that this is in here because especially the strength of schedule, like some of this stuff is just hard to find uh, just out there. And so for D1 softball to have it, not a sponsor, I'll just say it, but we are fans of, of D1 softball, and so it's nice to have that in there. I mean, look, Baylor's got the number three strength of schedule uh, in the Big 12 for, for, uh, overall, nationally. And so number one in the Big 12, UCF at 13 is the second best strength of schedule. In, oh, in the they Big moved 12. up. All right, so I cheated them by a spot. Thank you. Yeah, how, you got to you be you be higher on your own team that you can. No, I'm kidding. Uh, Oklahoma State at 19. Uh, nationally, so number three in the Big Twelve. So um, it's it's a good thing to keep an eye on, and it, it puts UCF in a good spot to potentially get in there. Obviously, not the weekend they wanted, going zero and three in Stillwater, but I mean they had some nice moments. They just couldn't get over the hump. But for Oklahoma State to get that sweep, and and I think is is big for them to try and stay in contention for hosting. I didn't think OSU looked as crisp and clean despite the three zero sweep, and I want to give UCF some credit for how well they played, but. Yeah, at a certain point, we, we, we can give you credit for playing well. You're going to have to find some place to get some of those wins UCF is. No doubt. they got to win some of these games. They had a chances. Lost the pitcher's duel on that Friday night, Willis, against Kilfoyle. It's 4-4 game in Saturday, sixth inning. A defensive miscue in left field. Opens up the inning for Oklahoma State with six runs. And I think that's one thing UCF's got is learning. You could get away in the American, which is a good league, but you could get away in the American by leaving seven, eight runners on base, maybe hitting one for nine with runners in score position, or maybe a misplay at left field. In the Big 12, it may, they pay you pay. And I think that's what UCF is learning right now. Uh, it's one of the things they'll take with them. Uh, learning there, hopefully they can. there's still time. The good news is you got plenty of time to still figure this out. Big series with Texas, as I mentioned. You mentioned Oak State, by the way, hosting. I have right now Oklahoma, Texas, Oklahoma State, Baylor hosting. Now, I know Baylor, that's going to be frowned on, but you just read the resume. If you look at Baylor and the body of work for Baylor, and that's what the committee always tells you. It's the body of work. You know, you could debate about whether that's the right approach or not. If you look at the body of work, Baylor's a top 16 team. The problem right now with Baylor, they're not intact. Mackenzie Wilson has that suspension. We're not going to get into all that, but she's out right now. Who knows? Whenever. They have injuries to their pitching staff, injuries to the shortstop. They're not a healthy team, and they're being exposed, and it's not going to get easier for them against Oklahoma this weekend. They're digging themselves a hole and may play themselves out of hosting, which is disappointing for Glenn Moore because you've talked to Glenn Moore. This was a team he likes a lot, and they have big expectations. And now you lose two out of three to Oak State in a series. You led the majority of the way. You get swept by Kansas. Now you got big, bad Oklahoma coming. You're digging yourself a big hole here. Baylor felt they had a case for hosting last year, and I, I thought they had a case for it. I understood why they weren't a host last season, but kind of, that set your goal this year of we think we're good enough to host with everything that we have back to our, to be losing the players that they've they've lost to have the the hits in their roster thus far. Like it's understandable why they're kind of struggling in Big Twelve play right now, and it doesn't help that you start off conference play with Oklahoma State, who's as good as they are. Kansas, who's on the rise, you have to go there on the road. And now you have to go to Oklahoma and and you're going to play them in Oklahoma City this weekend. Like that is, uh, you got one in OKC and two in Norman. Sorry, forgive me. Like that's also a really tough stretch when you are trying to get past injuries to have to open conference play with three of what look like three of potentially the four, if not five best teams, depending upon where you view Baylor 
in the con- in a in a currently deep conference. Like Bay- Kansas is playing really really well. They found their groove, and Casey Hamilton says as much in the interview later on. So like it's been a tough stretch. Baylor really needs. I hate to say this, a uh, 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 an Iowa State to show up on the schedule or a BYU to show up on the schedule soon. They just they need a, a weekend off, and uh, and that's it's understandable given what all they've had to play with uh, the injuries that are mounting. And the problem in softball, and you know this, there we may not know if this these any of these players will be back. We don't know. It's yeah. not like that. Like basketball, you know, Bill Self decides to announce very uh, fittingly after the selections are done that McCullers out for the tournament. But, you know, that's great. You know, save yourself a seat. We're not going to get that from Glenn in softball. So, I don't, you know, Orm, is, they need to get Orm back in the circle. Uh, you know, Tovin is a very key figure in that infield. When do they get into, I don't know, Mackenzie Wilson, that situation, honestly, you know, who knows. So, a lot of adversity there. You're right. They kind of need that, quote, Iowa. But you say Iowa State. Iowa State owns Baylor. They beat him four out of five. Glenn Moore told me they're the reason why they didn't host in his in his mind. So you say that's an easier matchup, but Iowa State seems to get up for Baylor. So who knows? They get up for everybody. I, Riley Crandall from Baylor has been awesome in the circle. I mean, she's really been keeping Baylor kind of in this as well. And, and at some point, like the offense is going to have to deliver here because when I mean, you played in these close pitching dual games in Lawrence against Kansas and the offense just Kansas's offense was that they were the team who was finding the timely hits to to get the winning runs and Baylor was not it's kind of the same thing with Oklahoma State they were in these games they were close games they were pitching duels and they couldn't find the offense at some point Baylor's bats are going to have to wake up because as great as Riley Crandall has been in the circle for them they're going to have to figure it out offensively or they're, they're going to continue to struggle uh Oklahoma hasn't struggled <laughs> Man, it, it it never fails. They lose one game, and then you it's you awaken the beast, and Oklahoma just pounded on a Texas Tech team that I thought would do a little bit more on offense against Oklahoma. Uh, Texas Tech did nothing. That is a good offense, and Oklahoma shut it down this past weekend. I, I, I really thought, especially playing in Lubbock, that Texas Tech might be able to do a bit more. They they did not. They They didn't do much of anything. Arguably, maybe the best weekend Oklahoma's played all year. Mm-hmm. Uh, so clearly Sorry, were, Texas Tech. <laughs> right. It just unfortunately for Craig Snyder, it just happened at his expense. And, you know, Oklahoma found theirs. It was consistent pitching, which is not easy to do in that park. They jumped on them, and they pounded them really good. And now it's going to be interesting. Now we're going to learn about Texas Tech here now, though. Because now you took a punch from Oklahoma, which everybody does. Which is the real Texas Tech team? You know, we got excited. They won two out of three against BYU. They've had a good non-conference. How do they respond from that Oklahoma series? They've got Iowa State next. To me, that's the most fascinating series. Is Texas Tech a legitimate NCAA tournament team? If they are, they need to beat Iowa State and win that series. If they are, I think they're fine moving forward, step forward. If they lose that series, now you wonder, are they getting wobbly? Because after that, they got to post UCF, which is an enormous series for both teams. Mm-hmm. Enormous. Because uh, that has ramifications as far as the tournament is concerned. So to me, I am really interested this weekend, of all the teams in the Big 12, how does Texas Tech respond this weekend, Philip? That's going to be interesting to me. Yeah, that series in Ames against Iowa State. And as we as we mentioned, Iowa State gets up. They get up in Big 12 play. They're going to be at home. So we're going to see how they respond. Texas Tech's got to have to figure out the circle. Um, OU, that that's the fact that OU shut down Texas Tech offense is one thing. But like Texas Tech in the circle has, has struggled. Well, that's been the question that I've had all year. Even in the BYU series, they struggled pitching-wise. BYU hit them pretty good, too. If Iowa State hits them good too, then you got UCF. I mean, it gets it's tricky for them. They are a fascinating team because they got good wins in that resume. Uh, but can they hold it? Because they've not been in this position before, at least in this in the Snyder era, obviously. You know, they've made the tournament in 19 different coaches, different players. This group hasn't been in this situation. Last year, nobody really paid attention. You know, they were kind of rebuilding it up. Now all of a sudden they've had success early, some optimism, some excitement, some expectation. Now you got smacked in the face. How do you respond? It'll be interesting. All right, I, I gotta, I gotta ask you this because it's interesting when the conference names a pitcher of the week, and then a national publication names a di- different national pitcher of the week from the same conference. Oh, the Big Twelve choosing Kelly Maxwell of Oklahoma, D1 softball choosing Katie Brooks of Kansas. 
NCAA softball, uh, Michaela Chester, who's there, also picked the same person, picked Katie Brooks. And so I'm curious from you, Eric, who got it right this week? D1, obviously, I'm going to say them, right? I didn't, <laughs> I, by the way, I have no say in any of that. Just for the people who are wondering, I have no say in what they select in that process. I'm in a different room. I'm busy trying to figure out the formula, who's getting to the field, uh, so, and then doing the podcast. But Katie Brooks was a big part of that, Baylor. You know, that's part of the thing that with the Big 12 that's a challenge for that league is in that it's such a great league. And I'm going to give you a plug here. My guest on In the Circle Thursday is Kat Osterman. Ooh. I think she's, you know her very well from her Big 12 resume. That was a pretty good get. But one of the things is the Big 12 doesn't get the credit, I think, it gets in softball because Oklahoma, oh, they win every year. So they, they, the perception is well, Oklahoma wins everything. They win all this stuff. And I think a lot of great players go under the radar as a result of that. But so there's a challenge of how do you reward Oklahoma every week, for, you know, the, their players every week versus players, other players in other schools. It's a back and forth debate there. Uh, it's all subjective. But Katie Brooks has been a big, big breakout player for Kansas. I talked to Jennifer McFalls about her. They would not be in this situation without Katie Brooks, the success they've had. Hamilton's great. But remember, Lizzie Ludwig's been hurt. That was their freshman who was on the all-freshman team last year. Brooks has stepped up. Coming into this year, she had an ERA over four. She's having a breakout year this year. That's why Kansas is having the success she did. And she was a big part of that Baylor sweep. So I agree with them going with Brooks there. I mean, Maxwell, yeah, she did what she did against Texas Tech. I mean, you know, good good job. So, I mean, the league. why not Co? Why can't we do a share? I don't know. I don't know. They don't ask me. It's, I don't know who picks. I don't know who picks them at the Big 12. I don't either. It's probably the, I don't even know either. I'll be honest with you. It might be the office. I don't know. The good news is the, I think the, the, the league will have a better situation next year because Oklahoma will not be in the league. So you're going to have, I think, more variety as far as the conference award winners every week. Whereas it's tough when Oklahoma is like putting up big numbers every weekend. How do you not give it to an Oklahoma kid versus, you know, somebody else? So, um, I don't envy those jobs. I'm glad I'm not a part of any of that. (laughs) Yeah, honestly, uh, uh, me too as well. Um... Introducing Royal Caribbean's newest ship, Icon of the Seas, the ultimate family vacation. The ultimate six slides, eight neighborhoods, zero compromise vacation. The ultimate never done that, can't wait to do it vacation. The ultimate chillin' by a different pool every day of the week vacation. This is the Icon of Vacations. Icon of the Seas, arriving in 2024. Book today. Come seek the Royal Caribbean. Ships Registry, Bahamas. I'm working on something we're going to try and look at next week because we mentioned, you know, Katie Brooks and and Casey Hamilton being such a great duo, an important duo for a Kansas team that really relying on pitching and defense. Uh, We've mentioned Oklahoma State last week a lot. Lexi Kilfoyle and and Ivy Rosenberry. She has stepped up coming as the number two there. Uh, Oklahoma has like eight pitchers that could all start anywhere. Uh, I I'm kind of want to look and see. I'm going to do a little little uh little research here and I I want to talk next week about who has the best dynamic duo in the circle. Cuz I do think Ooh, you can okay. say the two who have the lowest ERA and right now the the two combined the lowest ERA in the Big 12 are Ivy Rosenberry and Lexi Kilfoyle. But if we start breaking it down by innings pitched, batter you know, batters faced and things like that, I, it starts to it gets a little more interesting. To look at, so I'm gonna put a little data together. I'm gonna to send that out to you and Leah, and we can we can have a discussion about this next week. Because I, I I now I've had conversations with you. I've had conversations with some of the coaches before the season. Of you really can't just like the days of you have one pitcher who's the only pitcher who needs to pitch outside of like a couple innings a a, a season are kind of gone. You've got to have two. You've got to have two or three. And so it is interesting to look at actually having pitching rotations and who's got more than one. And I think it's hard to. Okie, as I mentioned, Oklahoma's got a bunch. Oklahoma State's got a great duo. Kansas has a fantastic duo. Baylor has a fantastic duo. It's an interesting, I think it's deeper than we think, and I want to take a look at it with you next week. Um, well, let's let's go ahead and look at the games this weekend. We've got three series as we pick each week. This is what we're going to do here. Uh, I did not do great last week. And so, uh, yeah, I went, uh, oh, I, I went. I went 0-3 last week because Houston lost a series and then OU and OSU both swept as opposed to the 2-1 and that I picked for both. You had Iowa State 2-1. and Good job. OU 3-0 and and then UCF 2-1. for So you went 2-1. You went I was two back and one. into a corner against two Oak State people. You and Rachel Becker. I was no. Cho- I was in a <laughs> tough spot. You gotta, it's, it's fine. 2-1 and one is good. It's a solid week. That's a winning week right there. He's better than 0-3. I mean, I that's what I get. That's what I get. That's all right. All right. So let's look at this week. We got three series that we have picked, three three game series. Uh, we're going to start off 
the one that you will be covering this weekend. I don't know. Do you are you good with UCF Texas, or do you want me to pick something else since you've got to cover this? Weekend? We can discuss about okay. some of the keys there. I mean, look, I mean, Texas is. I'm hearing it's going to be three sellouts. I've sh- I sent you what they're doing in the outfield over there with the kingdom, which uh, it's pretty pretty awesome there. I'm looking forward to that. Me and Alex Powers will have the call on that. I think Texas hitting over 400 offensively loaded. UCF, big crowd. Sarah Willis against that Texas lineup. You know they played once ever? It was in Clearwater. Really? They played in Clearwater. 2022 is one of the most wackiest, bizarre, ugly, unique games I've ever seen. UCF came from behind to win 15-10 to in a game that combined for 11 airs. 11 airs and oh. like nine walks. Texas went over in Clearwater that year. UCF ended up hosting that year. Texas didn't, but Texas got the last laugh because they got to play for the national championship. They made a run to the World Series. So that's the only time they've played. They'll play this weekend. Uh, I think Willis has to be good. UCF's pitching's got to be good. Got to keep Texas in the park. Play clean defensively. Situational hitting. Texas has a lot of great arms. You know what? I picked UCF last weekend. As a homer, that didn't work. They lost. So I'm going to go the opposite. Maybe I'll inspire them. I'm going to go Texas 2-1. And if they get mad, then they say, hey, you, you picked against us. All right, good. We'll keep winning. I'll just keep picking against them. Maybe that'll work. Who knows? Uh, but we'll go Texas 2-1 uh, to one there. I, but I think it's going to be a good series. I think it's a big series. If you're UCF, you got to take advantage of being at home. You're going to have a sold-out crowd. Uh, against a Texas team that's literally bussing from Tallahassee. They've been in Florida the whole week. So it's been fascinating there. Yeah, UCF's got themselves. They set up a little party. They've got they got party, party decks deck. there. Yeah. They're going to have a grand time out there. You're welcome to come down if you're on the last minute here. You yeah, let me, uh, let me see what I can do on that. Trace can hook you up. I'm sure Trace, just call Trace. Okay. All right. So, hey, all right. I'll let Adam and Trace see if they want to fly me out. And we'll, <laughs> uh, we'll put it on the uh, Suns UCF credit card, right? Uh, look, I, I think it's going to be a big weekend for you. I do think this is a big weekend. Like, UCF has got to really has got to try and find a way to get at least one of these games. Like, they'd love to get the series. But I think if you're UCF, if you can get at least one of these games from Texas, then it's a, it's a, it's a a from a postseason standpoint, and that's the goal, it's a good weekend. Like, that is a solid weekend. You're never going to say it's a good weekend when you win one game out of out of three. I understand that. But from an outside look again, that would be a good weekend. Um, look, I, I, I'm just going to – I'm going to ride with you. I think Texas wins this series. I really do. I, it's not a shot at our, uh, UCF. I just – Texas, even though we've seen them dip a little bit, is still playing at such a high level. And right now they're playing Florida State as the time of recording this. And let's go check. Last check, it was 6 nothing, uh Texas up on Florida State. I'm going to have to pull the score up here. As of right now, it is still 6 nothing at the bottom of the fifth, this course being in Tallahassee. So Texas with a pretty good lead here. I'll say UCF steals one. I don't know which one it is. I would lean, I would lean Friday or Sunday, but I'm going to say UCF is able to snag one with a – a sellout crowd weekend, a rowdy crowd, an excited crowd, and a UCF team that is is ripping and roaring for a, a huge opportunity here. Since yeah, they, they won't host Oklahoma, they didn't get to host Oklahoma State, but they do host Texas. That's a it's a big one from them. Okay, uh, we mentioned Baylor's beat up. They've got to face Oklahoma this weekend. As I said, one in OKC, two in Norman. It's really hard to try and and bounce back against Oklahoma. That's not a team you want to have to try and bounce back against. Eric, how do you think this was uh, this weekend for Baylor? You know, they play Oklahoma well usually. The problem is the pitcher that usually plays pitches well for them against OU is hurt. So they struggle to score runs. They're playing at Oklahoma. I know one is OKC and all that. I, I can't pick against Oklahoma. I I, I I know, you know, I think Baylor, I, they got to show me they could score some runs. Now, that being said, they've snuck up on OU, but I can't imagine – especially as being the only team that beat Oklahoma last year. I can't imagine Oklahoma's like, ah, we're going to take Baylor lightly. I think it's the opposite, and I don't think that's good news for Baylor. So I'm going to take the Sooners, 3-0. Yeah, I made the mistake of picking OU to lose a game last week, and I won't, I won't do it again, especially not at home. And, yeah, I think the point on, there's no way they've forgotten the one game they lost all of last year to Baylor. They they will not have forgotten that. They will go into this series – and because people are going to bring it up, they're going to be, hey, you know, the only team that beat Oklahoma, like that Baylor's like, can we all just shut up about that? Let's not bring it up. We don't, this is not the, let's talk about that la- next week or something. Let's not talk about it this week. Oh, you'll be ready. Oh, you'll be focused. I, I think it's OU with another sweep and, and Baylor looking desperately for some wins in Big 12 play. Getting swept this weekend would put Baylor all the way down at one and eight in conference play to start off, which is just not. I mean, I get it with with, wow. with teams they face, but that is just not 
the record I expected from Baylor. Well, at this and, point and in let the me take. I agree. And here's the thing that Baylor's got to be careful about. They have a good resume for now, as far as a host. However, as they lose more, for example, as we did this, Texas State knocked off Texas A&M. It's a big year for the state of Texas. That's one of the many topics I talked to Cat about on the In the Circle podcast. Texas State's in the mix to host here. If they were to have a big year and let's say beat Louisiana in the Sun Belt, I could see a scenario where Baylor has to go to Texas State and Texas State is the host. And that's not going to be easy for Baylor easy. So that it's tough. You're right. If they could somehow get a win against Oklahoma, that helped kind of stop the bleeding. Otherwise, you know, I still think Baylor can make the tournament, but as maybe not as a host. And that did a mid last year. Yeah. Uh, and, they, and they got a tough draw. I think they went out to Utah last year, if I remember correctly, um, which is also a tough spot to have to end up at. I mean, it, it it's just going to put that much more pressure on series against Iowa State and Texas Tech and and UCF, UCF. and Texas and BYU. Yeah. And so uh, every, with every loss they get, it puts that much more pressure to find more loss wins in, in Big 12 play because it's going to be hard to get a hosting spot with a – you know, with a, honestly, with a sub 500 record in conference play, it's going to be really tough to get a host. Well, and especially if Ormy the pitcher doesn't return, if you're the committee member, that has to play a factor. Yeah. And I, and it, I've had committee members on the show and I always ask about the injury and they're aware of it, but they don't commit. And I understand why they don't say anything one way or the other as far as injuries and the impact, they don't want to get caught. Always got to leave it vague enough to cover your. But one of the things that frustrated me last year about the committee was, Montana Fouts got hurt in the SEC tournament, if you remember. And they've seeded them five. I'm like, what are we doing? And they're making up this nonsense about top ten. Like, nobody in their right mind thought Alabama was a top five team when Montana Fouts was healthy. How can you think that with the question mark with Fouts? So, to me, the committee needs to take that into a factor. If Baylor doesn't get any of their players back, they're not the same team that built that resume early in the year that got them to the top ten. They're just not right now. Yeah, it's going to be something to keep an eye on from Baylor. Uh, okay, last series that we're going to pick here is we only pick three of the five each week. Uh, Iowa State, Texas Tech, another series that we mentioned. Iowa State hosting Texas Tech. Iowa State lost their midweeker to Kansas City on on Wednesday, but as we mentioned, got the series win 2-1 to one over Houston, uh, which was tough for Houston after getting that win over Texas the weekend prior. Iowa State, it's conference play. Houston has been good, not great this season. Eric, does does Iowa State do it again against Texas Tech, who's licking their wounds after Oklahoma? Do they get another series win in the Big 12 play and and add some bad losses to another Big 12 team's resume? Or does Texas Tech kind of rebound in Ames? This is, to me, could be the most dramatic series of the weekend. I would not be surprised if one of these games is a 10-8 to game walk-off possibilities. I, I'm, I don't know. This is the hardest series. I am really fascinated, as I mentioned earlier. How does Texas Tech come out? How does Iowa State come out after getting some confidence winning that series against Houston? They're at home. They seem to play better in conference. Sorry, Leah. Going Tech, two out of three. If Craig Snyder, tell, if they're for real, if you're a tournament team, you've got to win this series on the road if you're Texas Tech. If they get if they get swept or lose this series, I think doubt comes in there. So I'm going to go Tech, if you want. Yeah, again, they've built a a like they built a tougher non-con schedule to build a better resume, and they have a better resume than last year. Last year's non-con is what is really what hurt them. They're thirtieth in the RPI right now. They're sitting in a good spot. I mean, you've got a loss to BYU. You've got that UTEP loss. It's weird, but like it's it's not bad. But if you start piling on losses in series and Big Twelve play. Like this, and look, I'm I'm not gonna hold it against anybody for getting swept by Oklahoma. Pretty much everyone's probably gonna get swept by Oklahoma. That's just that's just how it goes. But when you get to face the teams who aren't Oklahoma, if you get to face the teams that are gonna be expected to be finishing in the lower half of the Big Twelve this year, like if you want to be for real and you want to make it to the postseason, you're gonna have to find opportunities for wins because there's just you know it's gonna be tough against Texas. It's gonna be tough against Oklahoma State. Now it's gonna be tough against Kansas, even with Baylor's Bengals. It's gonna be tough against Baylor. So. You're going to, like, I, I don't mean to pound on Iowa State, and I hope Coach Pinkerton isn't listening because Leah's not on the show this week. But, like, if you look at the teams who are now going to expect to be finishing the bottom of the conference, the Iowa States and the BYUs and the Houstons, like, you, you've got to get these wins. You've got to get these series. Well, look, and it, it applies to Texas Tech, and it applies to Kansas, who's at Houston. If you're Kansas, you've got all this positive momentum. You can't slip up against Houston. And for Houston, it's a big series for them if they want to get back in the conversation for the tournament. 
after losing two out of three to Iowa State to win against Kansas. That gets you right back in that conversation. So those two series are fascinating. And that's what helps determine, Philip, at the end of the day, in two months, when you ask me, why did the Big 12 get blank amount of teams in the tournament? These type of series that are under the radar help decide whether the Big 12 is a five-bid league, a six-bid league, or a seven-bid league. We've talked about the RBI. Iowa State's made their way up, but Iowa State, the amount of work Iowa State would have to do to get back into even consideration for his season is a ton. They're 88th in the RPI. Houston's at 64, BYU's at 61. So, it's, so there are, unlike other conferences where we go, well, why does the SEC get all but one team in? Because they find it, because they get through non conference and they're all sitting in a decent spot and then they get so many opportunities for wins or losses against good teams that it doesn't hurt them. And for the Big 12. Well, yeah. Well, and the problem, like, the example is Old Miss, who just goes to LSU and wins two out of three, which is right. just inexplicable. Part of it, in my theory, is I think the SEC, while it has a lot of depth, they don't have that great teams at the top. They have a lot of good teams. But they, in my opinion, I don't think the SEC right now has a true national title contender. They have a team that can get to Oklahoma City, but not like – to me, Oklahoma is a national title contender, obviously. I think Texas is a national title contender. I think those are your two favorites. So if you're a bubble team in the Big 12 like Texas Tech, you're it's hard to win – let's say three games against OU at Texas, you're probably, it's going to be hard to just win one or two games against them. Whereas the SEC, the, 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 the difference between the best team and the last place team ain't that big because that team at the top is not so great, even though the, certainly the, some of the media will hype them up as they are. But the reality is like Ole Miss can go in and beat an LSU team because LSU is really good, but they're not at the Oklahoma level uh, as far as a national title contender, in my opinion. So that's the dip, but the SEC does a great job of that. They don't lose non-conference games very rarely that they're, that they, you know, it's a bad loss. You know, Iowa State digging themselves a hole in the non-conference with some losses that you kind of shake your head. Lowest RPI on the SEC is Kentucky at 34. It's it just like the depth is there. I mean, the argument people are going to say is that Georgia has, it could win a national, is Georgia or LSU or Missouri, the where they're playing. I, I agree. I think, I do think Georgia is very good. Like I, 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 think I think they're the best team. I think they're the best team. I just question their pitching in that big stage, can it get there? But maybe if, I, if you've told me, pick an SEC team that maybe you could get to the national championship series, I would probably pick Georgia. No, absolutely. LSU is a little bit, if you actually go look at the resume, um, the games they've played, they hadn't played that many quad one and non-con. They played like everything at home. Like LSU's resume is, I understand that they're number three in RPI. There's a little bit of a paper tiger to it. Not saying they're not good. Not saying they're not good. I'm just saying that I'm not sure they're as good as maybe their record and the RPI ranking says that they are, especially when you lose two of three at home to an Ole Miss team that's fine. They're fine. They're okay. So I, I agree. Um, Eric, as a, it is always a pleasure. I'm looking forward to the games this weekend. You do a ton covering college softball, UCF as well. Plug it all, sir. In the Circle on D1 Softball Podcast. Check it out on all your favorite podcast devices. Uh, coming out in the newest episode by the time you listen to this. Cat Osterman, over an hour. So we talk Big 12 softball, Texas. We talk Big 12, as I mentioned, the Olympics. Uh, broadcasting, we talk it all with Cat Osterman. We talked about that. She's really passionate about the Big 12. Loves the Big 12. Uh, so that check that out. I will be on the broadcast this weekend on ESPN Plus for Texas and UCF with Alex Powers. Should be exciting. Texas number two ranked in the country coming into Orlando. It's going to be an electric atmosphere at the Plex. UCF always plays well at home. Should be a fun series there. And uh, for all other stuff I'm doing, follow me at Eric Lopez Eagle on your social media platforms. Eric, always a pleasure. Everyone, uh, if you're watching softball this weekend, enjoy. If you, like a lot of people, are going to be watching March Madness as well, which is just, how can you not love two whole days of college basketball insanity. And, and it's called March Madness for a reason. It's absolutely mad. I hope, don't forget, if you are listening to this before the games have started, make sure you enter into the 10-12 network, Charlie Hustle groups. Get your brackets in there. You can be entered to win. I'm gonna, let's just see. At time of recording, which is Wednesday night, it is currently 8.47 p.m. There are, come on, app. Come on, app. There we go. Technology never is fast. As we want it to be, there are 127 in the men's bracket group. So come join in. I'm in there. Lots of 1012 network show hosts are in there. Come join the bracket and you could win big. So 
Y'all enjoy the softball. Enjoy this interview with Casey Hamilton that's about to come up. Enjoy March Madness. We'll be back on Monday. Don't ask me what it's going to be about because if I tell you, it won't happen. Survivor 46 is here and so is On Fire, the only official Survivor podcast. And we have a twist this season. The winner of Survivor 45, D. Vyadaris, will be joining us every week. We're going behind the scenes of the biggest moments, the how and the why things happen, and the strategy and analysis you can only get from someone like me, a Survivor winner. Listen to On Fire, the official Survivor podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. She's been on an absolute tear in her senior season. One of the best pitchers in the Big 12. Very excited to welcome Casey Hamilton of Kansas to the 1012 podcast. Casey, welcome. Hi, thank you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. I'm thrilled that you're our first Kansas guest this season. Uh, Me too. It just made, made the most sense. You have been absolutely incredible. And then, I want to start here because your teammate, Katie Brooks is the one that gets all the praise this week after an incredible performance this weekend from both of you, honestly. Uh, she was named Pitcher of the Week by D1 Softball and the NCAA. The Big 12 chose somebody else. Uh, let's just start there. Like, I want to talk about you, but we got to talk about your teammate, Katie, who has been absolutely incredible season as well. How how did you feel getting to see the the accolades for her this week? She deserves every single bit of it. I'm just beaming with pride for her. I'm so proud of her. She's she's had this competitive grit in her all along and like to be able to like see her just thrive in the last few weeks and especially this last weekend like I it it couldn't be better for this team and I'm just so proud of her and she just deserves it so much so it's been incredible. This team really feels like it's been led by its pitching and defense. I mean what is it about this this pitching staff this season that you all seem to have taken this big step forward? I'd honestly give a lot of the credit to our newest member of the staff, um, Laura, Coach H. She has just been a spark for this team and a spark for this pitching staff. Um, She's really helped our mental side of the game and just like the way that we approach every single game going into the circle um, has just been really different this year and it's proved to be really effective. And um, as a pitching staff, being able to lead this team, lead them to success, like defense wins championships and if we can just hold other teams down to a few runs, one or two runs, we're going to find a way to scrape runs across on the offensive side, and we're going to win games. What's your relationship been with her so far? She's been on the job since December, so it's been a few months now. But what, what kind of relationship have you and, and Coach uh, Heberling built? We honestly, I think we clicked from the start. Um, I got the chance to kind of meet with her when she was going through her initial interviews and when she had her campus visit. I got the chance to meet her and um, – She's just a light for us. And the connection that we made off the bat um, was really positive. And I think she's had it, especially not just with the pitching staff, but with the whole team. She's been able to make that connection. And I think that's so, so important just to reestablish that trust between top to bottom. I mean, outfielders to pitchers, like every single person in between. All right. So we gave Katie her praise. Now we got to give you some praise since you're here on the show with us. I mean, this is your best season so far uh, in the circle dropping your ERA from 3.96 to 2.38 so far this season. You lead the conference with five shutouts. You had a 28 consecutive scoreless inning streak. Like you have been on fire for this Kansas team. What do you credit to to taking your game to the next level? I know you talked about Coach Hupperling, but I mean, there's a lot of work on your end as well. What is it that you have done to really take your game to this level? Um, there's been some physical, like strategic aspects to it, but honestly, I think a lot of it has been mental the mental maturity side of it. Um, I, I feel like I've only gotten better since I've been at KU. And um, this year, I I really think that the way that I can think the game and I can think from pitch to pitch and at bat to bat and just know that I can only control what I can control. And the best thing that I can do is throw my best pitch and hit the spot that I need to hit. And after the ball leaves my hands, it's out of my control. So just like honing in on every single pitch, um, has just proved to be successful for me. And I'm just going to keep writing that mindset out. Yeah, athletes have a tendency to have a lot of, uh, not not paranoia, but superstitions and, and traditions and things that they like to do on a regular basis. Like walk me through game day for you when you know you're going to get the start. Like what what what's your routine before a game? I, I don't consider myself super superstitious. I don't like to get trapped in routines because then that'll just psych me out. But um, I, as far as game day goes, I mean, 
Um, I, even though I'm just a PO, like I stick me and Katie Brooks and Lizzie Ludwig were the POs, but we stick with our team the whole time through warmups and we like to be around and be a part of, um, just like the energy that builds up into games. So we'll warm up with them. Um, I like to crack an energy drink open about 45 minutes before first pitch, um, to get that to kick in right before start slinging it. <laughs> but, um, don't have a lot of superstitions, but I just like to stay uh, kind of level throughout all of pregame. I don't like to get too high or too low. Just kind of keep my head in the right place. Uh, energy drink of choice? Probably Celsius. Um, the non-carbonated Celsius are my go-to, but uh, we tend to have a lot of Alani in the in the locker room before game time. All right, let's, uh, let's work on that sponsorship. Uh, look, <laughs> uh, coming into this season, I was really high on Kansas because I, I knew how much you had coming back. I, I talked to your two of your teammates, Ashley Anderson and, uh, and Haley Harper, last year about just how much of this roster was returning. And it's a ton. There's a ton of seniors and juniors. There's fairly, a lot of experience on this roster. And it really felt like this is kind of the team that Coach McFalls had been building to. And this was going to be that breakthrough season. So far... So good, especially when we look back at this past weekend with a sweep over Baylor, first sweep over a ranked team in, in a long time. And it really feels like you guys are clicking. Does it feel like that to you as well? Does it feel like this team has kind of found its gear or do you feel like there's still more that you can build to? Um, I think we've kind of, we found our gear, yes, but there's room to turn it up. And um, our, our defense has just been so outstanding and, I think I credit so much of that to the team that coach McFalls has built. And like, she preaches it all the time that team chemistry wins close ball games. And we haven't had many blowout ball games, but we've had a lot of close ball games and that comes down to trusting each other and just like having such great tight knit chemistry. And we're all playing for the person to the left and to the right of us. And um, so just being able to kind of like find that extra gear and whatever it may be, whatever niche we can find on that day, if if pitching isn't doing exactly what we need to do, our our offense is going to pick us up, and vice versa. Like we're there's room to turn it up, and we're just kind of getting a taste of that success. And winning is contagious, so we're going to keep it rolling. I, mean, we, I mentioned experience. How much of this team chemistry you're talking about do we credit to the fact that so many players on this roster have have been here for three, four years and have had important roles for most of McFall's tenure? Yeah, we talk about that all the time. We're we're just so blessed that we have a senior class of, I mean, there's there's eight of us. Only one has transferred in, but none of us have transferred out. So we've been here through the ups, downs, highs, lows. And um, I think that has so much to do with the leadership that we've been able to create for this team. Um, since freshman year, the group of us, we talk about it. Like when we're upperclassmen, this is going to be our team and we're going to lead this team and we're going to be good because that's what we've all been pushing for for four years. And finally, like this team is in our hands as a class. And um, we've kind of been able to do what we've been talking about for four years. And it feels really good. You get the sweep at Baylor. You guys have won 16 of your last 18. You got the win over Texas A&M on the road, which was huge as well. You've got, you're starting to pile up and stack up some really good wins. Postseason is obviously a goal. I, I'm curious. I've talked to different players, and, and we have Leah Nelson, who used to play for Iowa State on, and, and we hear about different coaches. RPI is such a big deal, and those those big wins matter when it starts to – we talk about resume building when it comes to postseason. How much does Co Coach McFalls, like talk about RPI with you guys? How much of that is a focus? How much are you guys paying attention to those kinds of things when looking at what you've done and what you still have to accomplish? Um, I think I would say last year – Last year, kind of when we started conference was when she got really transparent with us about RPI and um, just kind of put it on the table as is like, this is where we're at. This is where we need to be. Our goal, it will always be postseason, um, especially this year. We talk about it every single day. Every single day we talk about postseason because that's what we need to achieve. Because once you get there, anything can happen. So we got to get to postseason. So just kind of being transparent about RPI and um, understanding that we have to win the games that we have to win. And we have to take those big games away from A&M and sweeps from Baylor and take a game from Mizzou tonight. Like those are important things because it come the last few weeks, like RPI is really important and we've put ourselves in a really, really good position, but the road is only going to get harder from here on out. So um, if we can just keep taking some of those big games we're going to set ourselves up really nice. 
Yeah, at time of recording, this is Wednesday during the afternoon. Uh, Kansas is 26th in the RPI, which is absolutely a spot that just got to feel great. That is an absolutely great spot to be in looking ahead to the postseason. Like, I, I know nobody ever wants to look ahead. We're supposed to focus game by game by game, and I, I completely understand that. But is the postseason something you guys do talk about? Is this is a goal we have? Something that you guys are aware of inside the locker room? Yeah, 100%. Um, it's, it's super important to take every single game one at a time and take every pitch, every inning one at a time. But, um, you also kind of have to keep that in the back burner of your mind that we're working towards a goal and that goal is, is in the future and it is postseason. And, um, it, it's fun to come out every single game and win, but to come out and win a game and know that that just helped us reach our goal, it, that's even more important because, um, when when you're winning a game or when you're throwing a shutout and you know that that's going to help the rest of these girls around me reach their goal and kind of reach a potential that we've been talking about for so long, like that's that's most important. All right, you guys are playing Missouri tonight. By the time this comes out, the game will have been over and that's okay. But I, I'm just from a curiosity standpoint, do you guys consider Missouri a rivalry? Is Kansas-Missouri a rivalry in softball the way it is in other sports? Yeah, 100%. I, I think we take it just about as seriously as any other sport does. And, you know, the other thing is like a lot of us are local girls played from teams out of Kansas City. Like we know a lot of the girls over at Mizzou and not that it's any anything serious or hard feelings, but we know that it's that Bortle rivalry and we take it seriously. And we're going to we're going to come out and be chippy and be gritty and we're going to win tonight. You said chippy. This is the term I keep hearing is chippy. I like this term. Okay, who is I got to who's the biggest who's the most chippy player on the roster? I would put Lyric Moore at number one, and I'd put Savannah Derache at a close to number two. Um, but their their passion for the game is so clear and contagious when you are out on the field and playing with them. And it comes out as chippy sometimes, and it comes out as um, just passion, really. And it's they're kind of the battery um, for the dugout and for the team, and they light a spark when we need it. It's one of the things I love about softball so much is just you all are allowed to be passionate and have emotions and show personality. And it it makes the game that much more fun. It makes you all that much easier to root for. And look, everyone's personality is different. We we see some pitchers that stay very even keel and keep it all bottled inside. And we see pitchers and players who are very, very emotional. Where do you fall on that range between stoic and nothing and absolutely wild? Um, I definitely put myself more on more on the emotional passionate side of that spectrum but I think I have leveled out as as my career has gone on um in a positive way like I I think it's really important to celebrate the little things and celebrate when something good happens and when you make something good happen I think it's really important to celebrate that because um momentum in this game is everything but also like to be able to keep your composure when things don't go your way and that's that's a lesson that I've really had to learn as I've gotten older, um, because like as a pitcher, you're on an island and there's not a lot that can help you when you're not doing your best. So to be able to pick yourself up when things aren't going your way is the most important lesson you can learn as a pitcher on this stage. Um, but I'll never stop celebrating the little things and getting up and getting excited and screaming after a strikeout because that's what makes it just so much fun. All right, you mentioned good things happening. I want to ask, you awarded the Marlene Manson Exemplary Student Athlete Award back in February, uh, which is given to one senior female athlete every year at Kansas. How big of an achievement was that for you? That It was just incredible. I mean, I would, I think I'd put that at the number one highlight of my senior year. Um, just the honor of receiving an award under her name. I mean, she's been such a trailblazer for women's athletics and especially Kansas athletics. Um, I would encourage anyone who hasn't heard her name or doesn't know her story to look into it because it's incredible. Um, so just to be able to meet her and hear her story and receive an honor, like truly from Marlene was such a highlight. And then on the other side, just to like be recognized by other fac faculty and just members of KU athletics that I've just grown so fond of in my years here. It just means so much. All right, we're going to let you get out of here, but I got a couple of uh, questions I got to ask. First of all, you've been at Kansas for 
four years now, you've been able to play at every stadium, barring the three newcomers. What's the most difficult stadium to play at in the Big 12? And I, I'm, this is less about the opponent and more about just the, the venue and the fan bases you're having to go up against. Which one's the most difficult? Oh, um, I think I'd – and they're great teams, so I, I don't think it's too much of a surprise. But I'd probably say OSU or Texas, honestly. Um, and, I mean, I leave OU out of there because they pack the house every single game and they're – have the most incredible fans too, but um, at at Texas and OSU, something about those stadiums, they're just so tall and it's just so different than anywhere else that we've played. So it's a lot different atmosphere, but um, I mean, going back to last year when we got to play down at Austin and take a game away from them in that Friday game of the series, like winning in those atmospheres is incredible because being able to come in and be the bad guy and, and, take that momentum away from those stadiums nothing feels better than that is it fun being the bad guy it's fun being the bad guy every <laughs> once in a while it's really fun to be the bad guy. <laughs> well you watch the movies villain roles always seem way more exciting than the hero like exactly. heroes you want to be the hero every once in a while but you know being the bad guy it looks like fun sometimes casey well, like you have been absolutely incredible uh, i want to wrap on this i mean you guys are are ranked by D1 Softball, or yeah, D1 Softball has you guys ranked. You'll be receiving votes in their polls. That's not something we've seen for Kansas Softball for a while. How how do you guys keep that from impacting you? Obviously, it, it, that is a big thing for Kansas to get to be ranked. You don't want that to have an impact outside of just being like, that's great, we've got a lot to go. How do you keep level-headed about stuff like that? I think it's only going to push us, um, honestly. Like, we've... We were talking about it, I mean, after the game on Sunday and the locker room, we were saying for the last few years, we, we've we had all the same talent. We've had all the same players, um, but it just seemed like nothing would ever fall our way. We'd play these really, really good teams and we'd play them competitively and it just never seemed like the end result would fall our way, but this year it is. And it's because we're making these games fall our way and we're we're gritty and we're scrappy, we're chippy. And we're finding a way to get these runs across and win games. And so really that's the mindset that we need to keep moving forward with and ranked or not like getting votes or not, like that's the mindset we need to hold on to. And I think it's going to take us really far. Casey, again, thank you so much for your time. This has been absolutely fantastic. You are a great interview. Very, thank very you. good job. Uh, thank you. Good luck to you and your team the rest of the season. I'm I am rooting for as many Big 12 teams in postseason as possible. So, especially on those midweek games, like, go get it, guys. Yeah, yeah, totally. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Podcast Network.